First off, I want to thank everyone for attending our second annual California ACC Tech Symposium entitled The Promise and Peril of Digital Medicine. So today's conference would not have been possible without all of the hard work put in by uh, California ACC CEO Liana Collins. So before I begin, I want to give her a round of applause for putting in all of the hard work <laughs> for making today's event possible. Um, I also want to thank my co-chairs, Seema Persnani, Rigved Todd-Walker, as well as committee members Ray Zimmer, Yushi, and David Cho for their support of today's event. This conference series is about the future. There are many unknowns about how information technology will ultimately affect the field of healthcare. As the, Niels, as the great physicist Niels Bohr once said, prediction is difficult, especially if it's about the future. Despite the uncertainty, digital medicine is generating a tremendous amount of interest amongst healthcare professionals, technologists, investors, and the public. And that's evidenced by the turnout we have here today. One of the reasons why digital medicine is exploding is because of the convergence of long-standing trends in healthcare and in technology. This convergence puts us in a unique time frame where we can almost see this field really start to take off. In my mind, there are five main factors, three of them having to do with technology and two of them having to do with healthcare that are driving the rise of digital medicine. The first factor is accelerating computing power. For over a century, Moore's Law, which posits that the number of transistors within an integrated circuit doubles every two years, has driven the pace of technological innovation. Now we have an exponential growth of computing power, and for the first time, computers have the ability to process complex biological phenomena. This has profound implications for medicine. The second factor driving the rise of digital medicine is the development of biosensors. Biosensors transform biological processes into electrical signals that can then be analyzed by a computer. As computers become smaller and more powerful, we can now use biosensors, whether that be a Fitbit or a continuous glucose monitor, to constantly analyze and monitor human physiology. This is a graphic from a review paper published by Dr. Evan Mews, our panel moderator, and Dr. Steve Steinhubel, one of our morning speakers, that shows the possibility of biosensors tracking multiple organs. The rise of miniature biosensing computers throughout our body has the potential to deepen our understanding of human physiology, which leads me to the third factor driving the rise of digital medicine. Today, 88% of Americans use the internet, 77% own a smartphone, 73% have broadband at home, and 69% use social media. The hope is, is that one day we can take data from a variety of sources, including wearable devices or, and internet usage patterns, aggregate that data, and be able to identify high-risk individuals amongst the population. On top of this, electronic medical records have become increasingly pervasive over the past decade, more than doubling since 2008. And genomic information is becoming cheaper to obtain. Together, these trends have led to and contributed to a data explosion. These technological advances have the potential to transform a healthcare system in need of reform, which leads me to the fourth factor driving the rise of digital medicine. Currently, the vast majority of healthcare dollars are spent on the sickest amongst us. In fact, 5% of the sickest Americans consume 50% of healthcare spending. In the United States, we have a healthcare system that is expensive and mediocre when it comes to life expectancy. There you can see the United States. Far to the right when it comes to healthcare costs, but middle of the pack when it comes to life expectancy. This reality has led many to look to technology to be able to provide a cheaper, more effective solution. And it certainly, that solution doesn't seem to be coming from our politicians. On the one hand, Republicans can't admit that Medicaid and Medicare both cost less on a per patient basis than private insurance. On the other hand, Democrats won't admit that we're spending way too much on health care. Health expenditures make up one-sixth of GDP, but no American actually wants to spend one-sixth of their income on health care. Which leads me to the fifth factor driving the rise of digital medicine, which is a shift from volume to value. Um, we are now seeing there's greater and greater consensus that more health care isn't necessarily better health care. 
we're seeing a shift, a shift away from fee-for-service medicine towards bundled payment, a shift away from taking care of individual patients to taking care of populations of patients, a shift away from taking to treating patients just at the end of their life to thinking about how we can prevent disease before it becomes chronic and very expensive. Digital medicine offers us tools to be able to do that. There are tools that we can use for population medicine and there are tools that we can use to be able to um, prevent disease. These are the five factors driving the rise of digital medicine. A data accelerating computing power, the rise of biosensors, a data explosion, an inefficient healthcare system, and a shift from volume to value. So what's the future of digital medicine going to look like? Well, in one techno-utopian fantasy, maybe in 10 years, when you go to the emergency room, instead of seeing a doctor, you'll see this. Or maybe in 10 years, your doctor will have full access to all of your biometric data. Here's a cardiologist watching over his patient panel of 20,000 patients. Imagine if he could prevent heart disease with a push of a button that delivers an instant shock any time a patient walks into McDonald's. That's probably the only way we're going to actually prevent heart disease. Regardless of where digital medicine will be in 10 years, the future of this emerging field is likely to be shaped by the speakers presenting here today. Each one of these speakers has made contributions that have laid the foundation for a new digital medicine era. To start this conference, I would like to introduce you to the speakers, but before I do that, I want to put their contributions into context. Over the past 14 years, there have been key digital health milestones which have led us to where we are today. During this time, we've had four digital health companies launch, iRhythm in 2006, Fitbit in 2007, AliveCore in 2010, and Verily in 2015, two of which have already gone public. We've seen the completion of the Human Genome Project in 2003 and the initiation of the Precision Medicine Initiative in 2015. The PMI has dedicated over $200 million to the study of digital medicine. We've seen the approval of the first implanted sensor, CardioMEMS, for the management of heart failure in 2011. And while 2016 was described by the founder of AliveCore, Dave Al Dr. Dave Albert, as a trough of disillusionment, disillusionment for, because for the first time we saw a decrease in digital health investment, this year marked the beginning of the use of artificial intelligence in making medical diagnoses. In February, Stanford researchers announced they had trained a neural network to more accurately identify melanoma than board-certified dermatologists. So let's move on to the speakers. So Dr. M Michael McConnell is the only one of our speakers who has his own sign the McConnell sign, which on echo can identify a pulmonary embolism. In 2015, he launched the My Heart Counts app on a smartphone, which recorded data of close to 50,000 participants. The resulting paper was published in JAMA in 2016. In 2015, Dr. McConnell joined Verily, a subsidiary of Alphabet, as the head of cardiovascular innovations. Anna Sherbina is a big data guru. She's developed algorithms that can digest massive genomic databases. And one of her algorithms was able to um, identify biological ancestry within a diverse genomic database from different human societies. In 2015, she applied her big data skills to the My Heart Count study. And recently, she published a paper on the accuracy of wrist-worn sensor-based measurements of heart rate and calorie count. Incidentally, I heard about her research paper on Good Morning America a few weeks ago while I was getting a cup of coffee at the Cedars Doctors Lounge. Abdul Halabi works for NVIDIA as a global healthcare lead. NVIDIA is one of the fastest growing companies in Silicon Valley. Its stock price has gone up more than five times since January of 2016, so you may better make sure you stay for this afternoon's lecture. Much of the excitement has to do with the recently launched DGX1 supercomputer, which brings deep learning and artificial intelligence to fields as diverse as driverless cars to diagnosing cancer on a pathology slide. In 2016, NVIDIA announced a partnership with Mass General to use artificial intelligence to advance radiology, pathology, and genomics. And this year, NVIDIA announced that it was going to train 100,000 developers in deep learning to bolster healthcare research. Dr. William Abraham is a giant in the field of heart failure. His research demonstrated the benefit of beta blockers and chronic resynchronization therapy in patients with systolic heart failure. He also performed seminal research on the use of natriuretic peptides in heart failure. 
More recently, he has turned his focus to the development of implanted sensors that can aid physicians in heart failure management. His interest in sensor technology started as early as, as 2004, and in 2012, Dr. Abraham was the first author on the CardioMEMS trial, which is the first study to demonstrate that the implantation of a cardiac sensor could actually decrease heart failure admissions. The CardioMEMS device has proven to be worthwhile in patients with systolic and diastolic heart failure, and the benefits have been sustained years after implantation. Dr. Steve Steinhubel is a world's expert in the use of antithrombotics in acute coronary syndrome. His research established the indications for the use of dual antiplatelet therapy in patients with coronary and peripheral artery disease. In 2013, Dr. Steinhubel joined Scripps Translational Institute, Science Institute as the Director of Digital Medicine, and in subsequent years has performed novel research on, cardio, on the effect of meditation on the cardiovascular and nervous system, He's done research on using electronic health records to detect heart failure, as well as research on the use of wireless self-monitoring program on health behaviors. In addition, he's published influential editorial, editorials in JAMA and JAK on the future of digital medicine. And in 2016, um, his team, which includes the panel moderator, Dr. Evan Muse and Eric Topol, his team was granted a $120 million grant in precision medicine to study mobile apps. Dr. Szilard Voros is an early, was an early pioneer using imaging and genetic testing to, to predict cardiovascular risk. In 2009, he developed a blood-based gene expression test to assess whether patients with, had obstructive coronary disease. This test was named by Time Magazine as one of the top 10 medical breakthroughs of 2010. In 2011, he published a paper on lesion-specific and vessel-specific coronary calcium scores that has the potential to be more predictive than traditional coronary calcium scoring. In 2012, he founded the Global Genomics Group, and he holds five patents, including a patent for the lesion-specific coronary calcium scoring system and his blood-based genetic biomarker for diagnosing coronary disease. Vic Gondotra has been at the intersection of some of the most, excuse me, Vic Gondotra has been at the intersection of some of the most important tech turning points over the past 20 years. He spent 16 years at Microsoft and seven years at Google. In 2003, he was named by MIT Technology Review as one of the top innovators under the age of 35. In 2005, he led a team that launched Microsoft Live, which eventually led to the Microsoft Outlook calendar and the search engine Bing. In 2007, Vic joined Google, where he had a prolific career. He launched the Google smartphone app for Google Maps, the Google I.O. conference, Google Photo, and Google Plus. After an amazing seven-year run at Google, Vic left in 2014 to become CEO of AliveCore. Folks, these are the people who will shape the future of digital health. It is my great honor to introduce the 2017 California ACC Tech Symposium and our first speaker, Vic Gondotra.